So, hi, Mark. How are you? Doing good. Out here in uh, hot and humid Los Angeles today. I'm out here in cold, wet Ireland, so we're <laughs> we're we're, <laughs> we're at a distance. Um, yeah. uh, the the new uh, field flows box set is just out. Uh, it's, am- it's amazing. I must say, I'm loving the the outtakes. Is what I'm kind of not outtakes, but the extra stuff is what I'm loving. I thought Big sure. Sir, Big Sir, just oh man, what a great song that is. Yeah, I agree. I mean, it's 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 a it's never been surprising in retrospect how much how much great material uh, the band would uh, record and then just move on. Mm. Um, uh, but this period in particular, well, of course, we're covering several years, but there's just so much uh, stuff that either either never got released or in some cases, you know, came out years later. Yeah. Um, but they they did this all throughout their career. I mean, all the way back to you know, 60, 63 even, um, you know, record, recorded stuff that easily could have fit on one of their albums. And, it, you know, they just moved on to something else. I, I, I guess um, everything was, you know, it, 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 whatever, whatever uh, uh, they wanted to do immediately, um, you know, was more important. I mean, in particular, how, how Sam, I mean, I guess Sam Miguel might not have fit yeah. uh, thematically or, you know, but it, it's it, it's such a great track and and so much work went into it yeah. you know that it sat for another 20 years roughly um before getting released is, is pretty astonishing yeah i think dennis uh, dennis shines on the extra stuff i think he's such yeah, a great and a lot of, i mean so, yeah to some extent that that stuff not being released you know uh, had to do with you know politics and and inner band you know questions i mean he's such a big part of sunflower yeah, and then has no real role on uh, uh, on Surf's Up, but but seems to have recorded you know about half of a solo record. Yeah, um, yeah. in the same period. Yeah, what a great uh, like I always kind of wondered if he had kind of kept going because he kind of where Brian kind of left off, he kind of was going on his own tangent to something new. I thought is his solo record's amazing. It's a great record. Yeah, it's interesting that you know as Brian. Uh, uh, seated you know uh control um how, how the others uh you know filled in the gaps if you will uh mm. i mean dennis dennis may have been the most creative um of them but but carl was the one who seemed most well dennis too but carl in particular most adept at uh picking up the producer reins and also uh just seemed much more comfortable with the change in the way records were made. I mean, you know, when Brian was, was at the forefront, it was still pretty much, you know, get everybody in the studio at the same time and cut a track, uh, live and make all those, you know, those decisions. If you listen to his, I mean, the, the sessions either with the band or, or, or with the wrecking crew, it's just astonishing how he, you know, starts here and ends up way over here. Yeah. Um, you know, while he's got 12, got 12, 14 guys in the studio, that's pretty, you know, pretty unheard of. I mean, I've, I've heard a fair amount of other, you know, uh, sessions from that period and yeah, there are little changes, but, you know, clearly the, the arrangements have been pretty well locked down before they started, um, uh, rolling tape in Brian's case, he seemed to thrive on the creativity of doing it on the fly. Um, and by the same token, it always seemed to me that making records the, the the newer way, which was to do it in pieces, or as I like to call it, sort of layer cake yeah. uh, records, where you do a certain amount of basic track, and then you add stuff, and um, then, uh, then ultimately do, do the vocals. He seemed less comfortable um, with that. And on the other hand, Carl seemed much more comfortable with that, I think, because, well, I mean, it... It does allow you a lot more flexibility in terms of um, going back and changing something. Mm-hmm. Um, of course, you can <laughs> you can take that right around the bend okay. and um, uh, either, either never you know never make up your mind what you know what's what's right or what's the best um, uh, if you're not if you're not careful. And I've certainly seen that not with the not with the Beach Boys, but you know, I've seen that in my own in my own career. Um, um, you know, that's 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 the danger. I mean, yeah. you know, now when we have uh, you know infinite 
infinite tracks and you know <laughs> infinite re re recallability. Um, the da the danger is that you know you'll you know, you'll miss you'll miss the stopping point. Um, yeah. Um, but Carl just seemed seemed much more uh, comfortable with with that form of recording and. Um, I mean, it, sh it shows because you know, he was the one who really, who really sort of over, oversaw these projects, mm. um, even if they weren't um, necessarily his songs, his songs even more so. But I mean, he was the one who sort of kept it all, along with Steve Desper, you know, sort of kept it all on track. Yeah. Um, um, you would almost call him, you know, the, <laughs> the executive producer on top of uh, uh, producing so much of the music. Did was a uh, I can hear music was that that the first one Carl produced? Yeah, I believe so. I mean, the first one was released. Yeah, right, few, right, right, right. There are a few oddball sessions um, earlier, you know, where he's was a tune X, and um, you know, where where he where he uh, tried his hand at doing a wrecking crew hmm. uh, session. But I think that's the first one that he really did. Now that, and my recollection, without really looking at, it, is that that actually is a built up track it's not mm. um not something that was played you know live by a bunch of musicians although that's what it sounds like it sounds like a you know a kind of phil specterist kind of track but it was it was it was done um with successive overdubs if i if i'm remembering correctly not having right. looked at it in a while isn't that the strange thing when you think about it? brian was trying to do what you could do on pro tools now with smile like it was so he was kind of ahead of his time what he was trying to do all the splicing and everything Oh yeah, well that's that's something that Alan and I real Alan Boyd and I realized when we went to do Smile is that without um, random you know uh, random access ed editing plus having a, um, a, a database mm. with all the material um, uh, in, you know uh, saved so you could find it, uh, but most importantly that you could do random access editing and just you know you got four pieces you could try A B C D you could try, try A C D A you know. I mean, you could do anything in in no time at all, and um, I, I don't know what's more amazing, uh, more surprising to me. What's it's less surprising to me that 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 he he ran into this problem, but what's most surprising to me is that he did exactly you know that with um, good vibration. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's a, it's a slightly smaller scale, but um, and it's only one song, but that's exactly where it came from. Yeah. Um, I mean, the you know, the quiet section, I mean, that was a very, in, in Good Vibrations, that was a very late addition um, to uh, to the record. And we, you know, we have, we have semi-complete versions where the track is more or less the way, you know, we know it, but not quite. And, um, you know, there's an early version with a completely different chorus. Um, so... <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I, I don't know. I, to me, that's that he finished that is more surprising, really, than um, uh, yeah. you know that that, that smile uh, proved uh, somewhat insurmountable. I mean, especially heroes and villains, because he was just cutting all these different themes and and the variations on the themes, mm. and um, uh, yeah, for for whatever. I mean, well, the technical end of it, just you know, just just. Make, made that all but impossible i mean uh, even even having all that it was an enormous undertaking yeah um, sure. to uh you know to put all that stuff together what was it what was it like when you got the tapes the smile tapes that must have been just on well I, i'd had those for a long time um, oh really wow well yeah because in 80 uh what 87 i think uh somewhere in there i mean when when uh, the first uh, I started working for Brian in 87 and because I was working for Brian, I was handed the job of, of um, the first CD issue of pet sounds and, and the twofers and the box sets mm -hmm. and so on and so forth. But uh, around 87, I was commissioned to do a research because, you know, for the 20th time uh, <laughs> there was talk or, or the record label, you know, wanted to uh, put smile out. I mean, it had such a, you know, enduring um, uh, legacy that uh, uh, they wanted to put it out. So, we, you know, we did a lot of research, just brought all the tapes in and, you know, made oh. made reference mixes and so on and so forth. And then and then ultimately the project was abandoned. Um, so I've been hearing that stuff for, you know, 
for many, many years by the time we got to it. And then, of course, you know, the first part of finishing Smile was Brian, you know, finishing it um, uh, for himself. And in a way that, you know, it certainly wouldn't have been in 1966 um, because Brian's wound up filling, uh, what, two and a, I think two and a half, uh, two and a half discs? I can't remember. Well, certainly, or three discs. Certainly more than the single disc that, that was intended. Yeah. Um, and there's, there's no clear indication, I mean, except for what's written, you know, on the back of the, the album, the, the album cover that, uh, you know, he was trying to hold capital off with, uh, you know, what the album was actually going to contain. Uh, uh, but it certainly wouldn't have been what it, what it became in 2004 because he used everything. Yeah, that whole box set. Really I, I, have that, anything. I have that big box set of the smile thing. It's unbelievable. I love that it's in mono. I know. Yeah. That, I, I'm glad they didn't do some sort of weird duophonic. He didn't. Well, do that. yeah, it's in mono for two reasons. I mean, more than anything, it's in mono because uh, on a lot of the stuff, all we have is uh, rough mixes that were made at the time. There, there clearly was a reel of um, master takes that got lost somewhere along mm-hmm. the way. Okay. Um, uh, and we have a pretty good idea of what it contained, um, uh, and so, and then there were some tracks that had been pulled initially to for inexplicably to the reel that was used for stack of tracks. Um, uh-huh. or my sunshine, maybe one other one had been on that reel, but were then pulled again. And this is all you know, long before uh, uh you know, I got involved, and we've, and we've never found um, that tape, pretty sure we're never going to. Uh, for example, we know um, they they had the multi track uh, to mix Cabin Essence mm. at Capitol Studios, and we have all the mixes, but we don't have the the tape it was mixed from. So um, <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's lost that's... along the way. I mean, you know, frankly, it, 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 it's a shame, but um, you know, we are so lucky that you know we probably have ninety percent of what we know of that they were. And I can't swear to, you know, I, I would be surprised if, if there weren't things that, you know, were recorded over or thrown away or, you know, just yeah. being, you know, um, not worth saving, uh, rightly or wrongly. And, you know, on this project, we, um, we got three things um, from a guy named Don Goldberg, who had been involved with the Beach Boys um, during this period and uh, started um, uh, those, those three songs. Um, it's na- uh, it's natural, sweet and bitter. Um, and, and we found something. Oh, and we, we found uh, the "Won't You Tell Me" demo on that reel. Um, and when you know they did a couple of sessions, and then when it, when it was obviously not going to get finished, uh, Brian gave the tape to uh, Don, and he mm-hmm. sat on it for years. Actually, did some overdubs on it, and released it that way. Wow. Um, but you know, uh, we were only vaguely aware. Um, you know that that existed i mean the tweet better existed the other the other two things we had no idea that they were there all right um, i i don't know how sunflower wasn't hit like even breakaway i love that you put breakaway on i love that song i think it's such a great song like, it's weird some of those well, songs it's, never it's hit. pretty simple i mean you know and, and i'm <laughs> i'm a test case here because uh i you know i was buying beach boy singles when i was uh you know, 10 through 15 and even bought them, you know, when I was 12 and 64. So when, when the British invasion happened, you know, like everybody else, it was, you know, Beatles, 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 but I was, I still <laughs> bought the Beach Boys records and they still had hits. But hmm. when 1967 rolled around and suddenly we're all buying albums and we're buying Hendrix and cream and Jefferson airplane and singles don't mean anything. Hmm. Um, and I'd never bought a beach. I mean, I think I probably had bought Pet Sounds, but I didn't really, you know, I would, <laughs> same as everybody else, pretty much in this country, didn't really, you know, you know, didn't, didn't relate to it the way I had the earlier records when I was younger. And, uh, you know, so when, um, well, Sunflower came along, I mean, frankly, Sunflower to me is a pretty good progression from Wild Honey to 2020 to Friends. Yeah. That's wrong order. But anyway, um, to, to sunflower musically certainly yeah. 2020 is prototype sunflower with all you know everybody sort of you know doing their own thing um 
their image just didn't, you know, didn't jibe with what was happening. So it, if they'd been a new band, they probably would have done better uh, because what I recall is that there was an awful lot of, of um, different kinds of music being, you know, and groups being listened to in that period. I mean, you know, the, the birds doing, you know, country tinge stuff and uh, bands like Manhattan Transfer doing and, and Dan Hicks doing stuff that sounded like it came from the thirties, <laughs> you know, and the, and Miles Davis, Aretha Franklin playing the Fillmore. I mean, there was a lot of, you know, a lot of that uh, was respected, but the beach boys, even after they ditched the striped shirts or the white suits or whatever, still had that baggage of being an oldies act, you know, yeah. um, I mean, lumped in with, you know, uh, uh, no disrespect, but I mean, Jan and Dean and Gary Lewis and the Playboys and, you know, um, <laughs> that, that they were different um, didn't, you know, didn't seem to matter at that point. And it took it took changing their image and their music uh, when Surf's Up came along. And I think, frankly, the, the decision to, to make Surf's Up songs the centerpiece mm-hmm. was really, really smart because that legend had endured as a, as a, as I remember getting a habit somewhere in Cheetah magazine, which was a, you know, um, counterculture magazine in the sixties or late sixties. Uh, I think it was Joel Siegel wrote this article uh, about, about really about Brian, but about the beach boys also uh, goodbye surfing. Hello God. And talking about this, about smile and the smile myth. And um, you know, so that, you know, that, that's some that had that did transcend their their image, uh, but it you know nothing. It, it's not like it had come out. It it, uh, it was just something um, that that even even in the midst of all this stuff, when they couldn't get their records played, was being talked about. So putting that on the record, I think, uh, is a really you know re- really smart move. And you know, and songs about ecology. I mean, I, I remember getting the album, and you know it it fit with what I was listening to. Whereas right. Sunflower yeah, didn't, didn't, didn't because um, the, um, the subject matter was, um, you know, much more, I mean, it's a great record. Yeah. The subject matter was not political. Uh-huh. Um, I mean, barely, but I mean, you didn't have, you know, it wasn't, and it wasn't as personal. Um, yeah. Um, more traditional so yeah i mean it just there's always a lot of factors besides <laughs> i mean look how long it took that you know it took pet sounds to achieve um you know uh the status it has now i mean it took you know took yeah 40 years whatever it was i mean forever crazy that that remix you did at the stereo remix of of pet sounds is incredible i have the analog productions vinyl of it and that just sounds mm. amazing man how, how hard was that to kind of you must have to sync things and everything well yeah it was a little tough back then because we yeah. didn't have to get the first time i did it for the stereo mix i had to do it with two digital uh tape machines so it took yeah i mean it wasn't you know that bad but it took a bit of time second yeah. time i did it for the dvda I had a, I had a, a, a doll by then, so uh, right. syncing the 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 two or in some cases three tapes um, was a good bit easier. Now, I mean, I can you know I can I can sync a song up in you know half an hour maybe. Um, it, it's you know it's just so much easier. Yeah. Um, how, sorry. How do you yeah. um, how do you do you still use a analog are you in hybrid you digital and analog like mix and use more plugins are you using outboard gear i'm entirely yeah the last how long it's been but (laughs) you know the last bunch of projects have all been uh entirely digital right um uh, no analog uh mixing um at all and um the the main reason that I mean, besides the fact that there's an awful lot of stuff, an awful lot of plugins doing things that do not exist in nature, mm-hmm. um, so they allow for um, sonic enhancement, if you will, just just for want of a better term, um, that you you couldn't do uh, 
you know, in an analog medium. But the thing I like about it the most is that it, it removes the, the, the technology uh, challenge, the challenge of the, tech, of the old technology from the equation. I mean, having to deal with analog outboard gear and, you know, limited uh, 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 automation and programming and recall. And so you can, you can just go back to uh, mixing with the front part of your brain or creating with the front part of your brain, um, uh, you know, with, without, without having to worry about, well, if I have to go back to this or if yeah. I'm printing mixes, and we used to do this thing when we would print mixes from analog. Okay, we're, we like that, but we better print the mix, the, the vocal, the lead vocal up a half a dB and down a half a dB. I mean, it just got, you know, Right. Uh, <laughs> the recall. Know, all these things that were that yeah, that were that were uh, influenced uh, or restricted by, you know, the technology. I mean, the fact that it it it, it had gotten that far. I mean, mm. eight track, sixteen tracks, not not too bad. Although even there, it can be a bit daunting. But you know, twenty four track, more daunting. And then we were into you know, you know 48 track and sometimes bigger than that and so it it it, it was very unwieldy to um to, to do your best um with those things and then there's a lot of things you i won't bore you with the tech, tech technology no please but there's an awful lot of creative things you can do if you're mixing all digital um that would be impossible or next to impossible to accomplish in the in analog uh, media i mean so, i mean or complicated I mean, sub buses and uh, automate and plugins automate you can automate everything so i mean you know that's what i love about it if i go if i'm mixing and i go you know i really would like a little more uh, echo here i can just i can just write that and be done oh you know this part of the book is kind of strident i think if i you know if i if i reduced or changed the eq for these lines that would take care of it and that it'll it won't take much longer than it did to say that Mm -hmm. to do that and then it's there and it, it'll always be there you know are you, um, are you using a mouse are you mixing with a mouse or are you using any oh no no I, I i use a huey human user interface. oh the huey <laughs> i got so, this thing i got this thing lately i'll show you it it's um soft tube i'm sure you know it's like this console one thing oh yeah they're all, yeah, everybody's oh, making, man uh, they're amazing those things because it's got like yeah, an ssl I, kind of emulation right. and then you get a neve and an api and all that kind of stuff but it's just in not looking at the screen right You're just doing it that's what i like because yeah, i'm so used to looking at the screen and i think you know mixing with my eyes not with my hand ears sometimes yeah i ha i have a couple here i have a couple of avid s1s which i really like nice. you know, there's 16 channels of faders um and i also have another another room with a 24 channel um uh, slightly more elaborate surface and then you know i also work i also work at uh the iheart theater and we have a 32 fader um controller there which for live is is perfect because well 32 faders is about the most i'd ever want to sit in front of actually 24 is even better you know because otherwise i'm going to sort of reach for the last eight <laughs> but the beautiful thing about a controller is that you can build snapshots or layers so you know if i've got 10 tracks of drums i don't need to see that in front of me all the time i just need a master fader but if i push one button i'll have all the drums in front of me again so it's it's um the ergonomics are just you know way way better and uh, again just you know uh, allow you to be creative as, a, as opposed to chasing the uh the technology over the place i remember i i got hired to sub for somebody on a job a few years ago and in a, in a video truck it was some little you know live thing it's an analog console and i'm looking at it going oh my god you know, <laughs> there's like there's like you know 20 knobs for each channel and then it's just like uh, you know i mean i've got to have all this in front of me whereas you know if it's if it's if it's uh, all digital I can I can look at what I need to look at and then you know yeah. put it away essentially and not have to see it. All I have to see is the you know the fader and and uh, maybe a few echo sounds if I even want that. I mean, uh, yeah, it just uh, you know it, <laughs> it removes 
an awful lot of impediments. And then, of course, the fact that it's small and low profile, you know, um, it, the, the, the console itself has no has no effect on uh, on the sound getting yeah. to you. Yeah, so that's a plus. Do you sum your mixes out through a summon box or you just sum through Pro Tools? No, I'm doing it all all internally. Um, and, and a lot of that's because there are an awful lot of uh, mas- master plugins that um, you know, can make a tremendous difference uh, for the positive. And uh, yeah, you could sum it out and do it in pieces, but um, and I and I could. I mean, I still have my studio with a big API console, and I don't know what to do with it. Oh man! Um, but um, yeah, it just uh, it 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 hasn't seemed like the right thing to do for a long time. And the other thing is that that you know I can if I decided. You know, right now I wanted to go mix, uh, just you know, see what see what a new mix of say Johnny Carson uh, would sound like. I mean, I can I can uh, be uh, be up and and actually being creative with that. Yeah. Yeah, in about half hour, forty five minutes. That's good. Because um, yeah, I because you know there's a whole lot of this te- you, know, you build templates. Um, you know, so when I start a mix. Um, you know all the all the standard stuff that that I know I'm going to want the uh, you know whatever reverbs I'm into this this month uh, doesn't change that much, and then you know the the bus processing and this band bus processing or you know whatever or e- even down to you know what in general I like to start with on on every instrument. Um, mm. I mean, you know I can install all that very very quickly, and. Um, you know, as compared to, you know, what it used to take to get a mix up and running, um, yeah. where you could actually listen to the music, you know, you don't, the worst thing you can do is take too long to get to that point. <laughs> yeah. the, the trick is, the trick is to get the whole thing up and running where you can hear it as a performance. And then before you burn out, you know, yeah, start adjusting. And then, you know, some of these things when, I mean, I'm finding, I've been, I've been listening to some of that love you stuff that era and it's much trickier um, right. to get right. So the fact that I can do it and come back to it uh, and maybe come back to it again um, is, you know, is really a godsend. Hmm. Um, Why is it trickier? Um because well uh, partly because the arrangements are are kind of you know offbeat Mm -hmm. and the recording is as well Um, right uh i mean if only you know almost all of that stuff is using a a synth a synth for bass yeah and that's tricky uh the drum tracks are very limited um uh, i mean they Love You stuff tends in a lot of ways to sound like the tracks were more like, I mean, they're not demos, but that they were recorded more like demos than, you know, really, really worked on as um, performances. So it's a little, it's trickier to um, to make everything fit than it would be, you know, uh, even in the Sunflower period where, mm-hmm. where you had a fairly traditional approach to uh, um, to the recording. And it's much. It's also you know the, the sunflower serves up there. It's much more elaborate uh, mm-hmm. and backing tracks. The vocals are always good, but the tracks, um, you know, just by the very nature. But that's also the the charm of of, <laughs> of uh, a lot of the later stuff. Yeah. What, what's your uh, speaking of plugins? Run the plugin line. What's your go to plugins? Have you any ones that you're kind of because you know you always get those plugins that you kind of always like, kind of use. There's yeah. Kind of I mean. Yeah, and I'm not I'm not someone who get, you know is all hung up in the oh you know does this does this uh, version of the Neve 1073 actually sound like a real 1073 I you know or, yeah. I don't even compare them I just tend to use the Waves uh, 1070 the VQ4 the 1073 mm-hmm. um, emulation I use that a lot um, but I also use the uh, you know the Avid EQ7 and, and other you know other odd ones um mm-hmm. here and there and then there's all kinds of specialty stuff i mean uh um, you know I'm, <laughs> I'm amazed at some of the stuff that uh you know uh people are coming up with i mean uh it's 
crazy. Some of these, you know, these autom these automated equalizers, and um, you know, uh, yeah, Gulf and all that plugins, and yeah, yeah. I mean, it's just you know. What do you what do you think of the tape machine? Because I've never used tape, so I can't. I cannot go. Oh, that sounds like tape. But let's uh, do it. Something. I mean, I'm not. I'm not somebody who could ever want would ever want to go back to using tape. Uh, <laughs> But, you know, but, but uh, a lot of the tape machine plugins, especially the UAATR one, right. really, yeah, there's all kinds of sounds in that one that, um, that just work. Um, right. And not always the one you would expect. I mean, um, and I, I don't even know how accurate they are because for one thing I noticed is if you, have, if you set it up to 15 IPS and you go to 30, it's definitely going to get a lot brighter. Right. And that's not really what I remember from, um, you know, from, from, from real tape days. Um, but sometimes, you know, that, uh, 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 you know, doing that works really well. And I, but sometimes taking it down to seven and a half where it's a lot, you know, darker and grungier, yeah. that can work too. Um, cool. So it's, and that's about to me. That's about the best one. The other, uh, uh, there are issues with it, mm. um, only because like like a number of UA plugins, they built alias aliasing filters into them to make them actually sound like the analog gear they were they were right. copying. Problem is that if you look at it on a spectrograph, yeah, and of course, an awful lot of people do that. <laughs> It looks like if you're in a high res, you know, if you're presenting it as a high res um, uh, mix, uh. it looks like it rolls off. If you put it on the stereo bus, uh. it looks like it's rolling off at around 50k or something. It's not, but that's what it looks like. So okay. I, I have, I've had, I think we may have gotten away from that because nobody's really brought it up in the past uh, seven or eight years. But uh, I remember re uh, remastering pretty much the whole catalog and then. There was this complaint from the label that, you know, oh, well, we looked at it. The <laughs> UA fessed up, and somewhere I have a list of all of all their plugins that, um, that, that do that. So I had to go back and, and uh, you know, redo an awful lot of work. Uh, wow. Because people were looking at the music as opposed oh, to... Oh, man. <laughs> so you can never even hear it. Like, we couldn't... Our hearing wouldn't even be good enough to hear, like, 50,000. Well, it's not... It, it, it isn't actually doing that. It's... It, yeah. it, it, uh, I don't quite know how to explain it. it. I mean, it's way above anything that, yeah, uh, uh, any any of us are going to hear. And if it wasn't, they wouldn't have done it. Um, it's just something they need... They, you know, there's all... I mean, there's... I, I have to find the list, but I mean, it's the ATR and some of the pull texts and, you know, uh -huh. um, I do, I'm, I'm actually me and dig that list out. I think I know where it is. <laughs> uh, I, I mean, but so, yeah, but I, I, I do look at that and I avoid using, unfortunately, mm. I avoid using the ATR because we're always working at high res and mm. they want to release it high res. So uh, I just, you know, I've just stopped using that particular plugin on the stereo bus. And I do tend to check with a spectrogram um you know what what the mixes look like um at the end of the process to make sure that they're you know they're not giving the illusion that they're they're not high res right. ironically <laughs> yeah, the other yeah, way you can also solve it is is if you if you um uh, whatever it is if you record if you play it out analog and re-record it at anything you know um whatever you want i mean play it out analog and re-recorded at 192 24 that's what it'll look like right um so it's it's a bit of a uh, a labeling you know thing um that people want to buy you know buy the stuff a certain way yeah uh, and they have expectation <laughs> yeah well what, what what's it like being a beach boys fan as a young person and then you're now working on all their stuff uh, for the past, like, uh, since the eighties, nearly. That's incredible. 34, Thirty-four years. Yeah, that is incredible. What's that like? Um. Well, I mean, it's not like it's the only thing I do. So, I mean, I've made a million records in the you know my forty, fifty years of yeah. uh, doing this. This has just been kind of a constant, um, for, you know, for the most part. I mean, I did all of Brian's solo records uh mm -hmm. save uh imagination 
and the way I would really count on radar anyway. Um, from the first one uh, through the last one I did, Disney, I guess, yeah. Um, uh, but <laughs> I mean, I've just always liked the music. I mean, before you know, before I got involved, and and uh, um, all the time I've been involved. So it's just you know, it's a great catalog to work with. It it it's um, it never gets you know, um, it never gets boring. That's, yeah, uh, musically. Um, I mean, I'm, you know, we're just starting to, to, uh, you know, look at the next, the next year. I mean, looking at, uh, for all the passions oh, and, uh, live at Carnegie Hall. Um, and, uh, I've still, I've got a, still got a pile of tapes. I need to, I need wow. to transfer. We've been transferring stuff to digital for, um, a little over well, almost 22 years now, Whoa. but there's still, you know, still stuff we hadn't gotten to so for this actually this might be the, the first time that we've got a fair we're well, not a fair amount but you know probably 20 or 30 tapes that uh, we just hadn't gotten around to uh mm. transferring in the past uh-huh. uh, how, do, how did you um get into the art of producing and mixing did, were you in a band first and then you went that route or? no i've always been a been a behind the scenes guy i started out in lighting uh, a million years ago, I, in the fabulous '60s, I was actually I had my own light show company. Oh wow, that's in, cool! Or, yeah. yeah, well, it was a lot of fun, but you know, it wasn't exactly a, a career. Uh, <laughs> so uh, from there, I, uh, uh, I had a partnership and um, had a sound uh, sound company um, in the early '70s, and we did yeah, you know, we did a lot of smaller shows. I mean. Our sort of constant clients were like Seals and Crofts and Livingston Taylor and Manhattan Transfer and mm. Shana and, uh, um, and but we really it, you know this is and this is the days when nothing was off the shelf. I mean, you really you know almost had to build it yourself. Um, right. And so we really you know it worked for a while, but we were we were we were not poised for the big time. And so I, I gave I gave up on that after a few years. Came out here and worked in a couple of pretty crummy studios. Um, uh, not, under, I mean, I got to engineer, but I didn't, you know, what I didn't understand at the time was that I wasn't, I mean, I could teach myself certain things, but <laughs> I wasn't going to get the experience of seeing how, um, how, 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 you know, how successful, you know, and, and, and good engineers did their job. And um, uh, so that didn't really lead anywhere either. And uh, ultimately, I went back east, uh, where I'm from, and went back to college. And through a very, very strange set of circumstances, literally one afternoon, got a phone call um, that uh, Frank Zappa was starting a tour in Hartford and needed a PA mixer because the guy they had hired was deathly ill and couldn't do the tour. And so you know, four o'clock, I come home from school, get this phone call, uh, uh, get on a plane, fly down to Hartford, and I'm mixing the show by the end of the night. And, wow. Uh, um, I worked for Frank for a little over a year uh, and then went on. I spent the next I spent the next three years pretty much um, touring and doing uh, concert sound. I worked for, uh, for Zappa and then ELO and uh, Earth, Wind & Fire, Rufus, and then I started working for Journey and uh, helped get the, their, you know, their breakthrough record, Infinity, um, finished. But by then, I had really had enough of touring. Mm. Um, and I wanted to get back in, in the studio. And with the help of uh, George Massenberg, who was Earth, Wind & Fire's engineer and who I had um, done a bit of second engineering, he... He helped me get a job at Sunset Sound, you know, big time studio here in LA. Oh. And uh, so finally, at the age of 26, I guess, about, you can't be much older than that. Uh, you know, suddenly I'm now working, you know, assisting the biggest guys in the business and making, you know, and just making contacts. And, um, um, you know, after a few years, uh, I went independent, which didn't really turn out so great. But somebody I knew, 
I had met while I worked at Sunset told me about a job opening up at, at Warner Brothers Records studio, Amigo. I uh, went out there, had an interview, got hired, and uh, started doing all these incredible records. I mean, I, I did Randy Newman's Trouble in Paradise. I did Three Amigos soundtrack. I did Los Lobos' first record. I did a whole bunch of stuff. Wow. Got my wife there. Um, and then just, you know, the, just it's, it's, it really is like a snowball. And yeah. then, as, you know, I got the job doing all this Beach Boy and Brian stuff. Because one afternoon I called uh, uh, what was then Ocean Way, had been Western Studios, and to book, I presumably to book a, something of my own. And the, uh, set, the, the booker said, by the way, we have a last minute session, I, you know, two days from now, uh, Brian Wilson's coming in and they need an engineer. You want to do it? I'm like, sure. I'd worked with Carl a little bit. Ironically, I engineered the... Um, background vocal session for david lee ross california girls oh, that is cool because <laughs> i worked at warner's and um but i'd never worked with brian but of course i heard all the stories so why not and so this was the height of the landy years and that's oh. actually why it was like that landy used to you know it was a control thing i guess you know okay you know we're, we're done for the week or whatever you know and then he would suddenly tell the assistants no i want to put i want brian to go in the studio and work so find a studio, find an engineer. And that's, so that's how I, you know, that, that's how I got hired for that day. And, uh, I stayed, I was on that project for over a year. Wow. Um, um, and that's, you know, that's led us where, <laughs> where, we, where we are today. Um, I mean, it's more than enough, but that, that, that's really all, all that came out of that association. I mean, there've been a few, a few people that have come to me over the years and like, oh, you do this, so you know, we'd like you to mix, mix or record something. But um, uh, I would say, actually, other, other than the thirty-four years of, of work both on Brian's records and, and on the Beach Boys catalog, it hasn't it hasn't really been something that career-wise has led, um, you know, led, led anywhere else as opposed to other clients. Um, hmm. Well, I guess because my other clients were always producers so they were always you know yeah here's another act we're going to work with or you know so um it, it it wound up being those those kind of things wound up being more varied although i did well i guess that's not quite true because when i went to work on brian's first solo album i met andy paley who was co-producing and we did an awful lot of projects together in the uh in the 90s mm. uh, uh, he, you know he worked for, uh, for sire records for for Seymour Stein, so we did, you know, all these soundtracks and and uh, different artists. Um, nothing that ever really hit the big time, but you know, yeah. um, you know, a lot of big pro Oh, and I the other thing about working at Warner Brothers was that I uh, I wound up uh, doing all the engineering for the Hendrix Estate for like fifteen years. Wow! Um, Alan Douglas came into uh, Warner's to put together the kiss the sky project so i did that and then you know uh he kept me on doing projects until whenever it was and around 2005 i think somewhere in there where the the family sued to get it back um yeah. um but I, yeah i mean i've kind of that's that's way in the rearview mirror but yeah. uh, uh you know i mean that went on for for a long, long time, we did a lot of stuff. I mean, a lot of live records, um, well, mostly live, you know, live stuff. Monterey, Berkeley, um, Nebworth, uh, Woodstock, um, a few, a few studio things, but, but, but mostly what Alan was into was releasing all the live, all the live material. Jeez, I remember. Um... I, I'm from a, like a tiny town in Ireland and I was up in just the pub once and I was like looking across the room and, and the, the guy who owned the pub, I was like, do I know that guy? And he's like, oh yeah, it's Mitch Mitchum. He comes here all the time. I'm like, really quiet wow. guy. He just, he just go, go to like this tiny place and he'd like just be super quiet, just drink a beer, whatever he had, no one would bother him. He just loved that. I was like, That's Yeah, cool. I had him at the studio. Um, we were doing... A voodoo soup was the outside. It, 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 it's not in print anymore. 
and Mitch was involved with that. Um, I forget exactly why. Um, what he was, we didn't play. Uh, I don't think I don't remember him playing. No, uh, but it, I remember him being right. I've got a picture up over there of, uh, <clears throat> of us in the studio. It, it also it, it was so, you know such a um, fast paced time. Um, it, 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 it's funny to think about. It. It's a, you know it's, it's, yeah, it's a while ago, but, but um, um, all that stuff just sort of stopped. I mean, the you know record making. I mean, just, you know, sort of stopped in the last, uh, well, I don't know, it's been like 10, 15 years, something like that, yeah. um, except for these, primarily these Beach Boy projects and a few other things here and there. But, I mean, you know, it the industry has changed so much. Mm. Uh, you know, for a while, a, a really nice thing was that bands could do their own record. Um, I mean, you know, hire a real studio, you know, do a real record and uh, put it out either well, put it out themselves and and make money yeah and then that and that ended. <laughs> yeah. so um i mean it's okay i you know i i will do things I, I've, I've done a fair number of things in the past year actually uh just to help <clears throat> to help you know bands that i've worked with that yeah. you know found themselves una unable to play live obviously and worse you know losing their day jobs hmm because of the pandemic so um one of the things i did last year was go through all of my archives and get them all cleaned up and retransferred and you know organized um and uh you know did did a, did a few records for for people um you know from that from that material things that they had forgotten about mm. um, uh, just to get a little something you know just to help them out and get a little something going yeah you're I, and I, I was i always thought it was cool when i watched that love and mercy movie and you oh, were playing yeah. chuck brithman that was sweet i was like i know that dude i was like oh it's mark Lynette. i was like yeah. sweet man what was that well, like I got, dude? I, yeah i got hired to be the tech consultant for the studio stuff i mean that bill, bill Pollock, the director really wanted it to look yeah look like, like it was a real documentary and and to make sure that there weren't any of those stupid faux pas you see in all these movies it's like when i watched the queen movie it's i mean it's almost from my point of view i mean i can't tell you whether it's the right drum kit or the right guitar or anything although they, i know they, they they did get the loan of brian may's guitar which is yeah. smart yeah. but there's one studio scene where uh the freddie mercury character is is you know has got a mic and, and he's singing into it the wrong way i mean <laughs> you know, it's a mic it's a front address mic an re20 oh, no. but it's like this and he's thinking you know um oh no I hate that stuff anyway so bill really wanted that wanted it to be that accurate they hired musicians to play the musicians you know um so i got hired to be the tech consultant for all the studio stuff and um and actually you know helped with this you know help proof i proofread the script and you know made some corrections none of that you know that's what i and then at some point, I guess they decided that rather having, uh, you know, having me try to teach, you know, somebody how to just, you know, most of what I did was I sat there and, you know, looked like I was engineering. So rather than have me teach somebody how to do that, they would, they would, you know, see if I could do it. And uh, so I did a little screen test and they said, fine. So then to this day, I get, I get little $30 checks every oh, once in a while. Oh, sweet. <laughs> get those royalties in, eh? <laughs> Yeah. that's savage do you, so, um, you know, it was a nice experience that's cool man i i thought the movie was great i liked the way it was like you know i had to it, at first i wasn't sure about cusack playing but then i thought that's ah, kind of cool yeah like, i have a problem with cusack and i yeah. don't know whether it's because well partly because you know i look at him and i see john cusack but also because i the period that period that they're doing i was there so if they had actually if they had done, you know, sessions in the studio, yeah, you, you'd have somebody sort of being me. Um, and I thought it was actually, I did think it was kind of unfortunate. And I don't know why they did this. They didn't present Brian creating, yeah, uh, in the eighties. I thought that was kind of weird. But uh, yeah, so but but knowing that Brian made it, you know, made it kind of weird for me. Now, I mean, you know, I, I and I thought Paul, I think Paul Dano did, did a fantastic job. 
Incredible. Chandler Bryan. And the fact that he's a pretty good musician. I mean, they didn't, they didn't hire him because they knew he could play piano and sing. Turned out he could. So, you know, the scene where he's doing God Only Knows for his father, that's yeah. Paul playing and singing. I mean, yeah. you know, that that just makes it work rather than, you know, some fake thing. That's uh, cool. Yeah, I, I I just thought he did a he did a really a really really good job of, of portraying um, uh, the Brian and again it kind of looks like him you know yeah I would have personally preferred that they had you know had him play Age. the older Brian as well yeah. I think it would have connected more but that you know that was something that uh, that, that writer likes to do that same guy who did the I haven't seen it but the one where Dylan five or... people play Dylan yeah yeah. yeah. I haven't seen it either, but I heard it's like, eh, you know. I know it's trying to be kind of artsy, but you know, I, I get well, what I get. Yeah. yeah, I get what they were kind of doing. That kind of like, he's different, you know. But I don't know, you know. It it kind of works and kind of doesn't. But yeah, I would have loved Paul Dano just the whole way through. Guy's a beast of an actor. Yeah, yeah. And I, I think I think if you, if you'd made him look older, it would have been it. It would have made the connection deeper. Now maybe it would be different. Mm. You know, if the intention is that he's sort of like two different people, mm. then uh, you know, would you, then, would you, then it would then it wouldn't be this, it wouldn't be different in the same way. Yeah. Do you get do you actually get time to listen to much music outside of the Beach Boys, like music that you like as well? Like you... I'm really, you know, it's it, except for what I wind up working on um, at iHeart, for example, day before yesterday, I I did uh, an Imagine Dragons show. Okay. And actually, I'm, let's see, I'm waiting to see whether my mixes are going to need to be updated. And we're doing uh, Coldplay next week. Oh, um, cool. Other than that, uh, you know, I, I don't really, um, I don't really listen to new music. I mean, I, you know, I see what's on TV and uh, find it mostly distressing. <laughs> um, well, it's same. funny, you know, I, I, I had the TV on last night and it was one of those time life Hits of the sixties, you know, yeah. You know, for an obscene amount of money, I couldn't believe it. It's like one hundred and fifty. Was it one hundred and fifty hits for like four, four or five? It was like it was like one hundred and fifty dollars. I mean, it was like ridiculous. Yeah. You know? But anyway, but it's just like song after song after song. You just go, my God! I mean, you know, this stuff was all so good, and it's nothing like what you know what's what's going on today. Yeah. Um. um I remember this a few years ago, working uh, doing a, a festival, and um, I forget who the artist was, but he's doing all his new stuff, and it's yeah, it's okay. And then and then he inserts the oldies in his set, an oldie in his set, and it was um, I, think it, I don't know if it was Ain't No Mountain High Enough or something, one of those Motown Great songs. Stuff. I mean, and suddenly the whole thing just came alive, you know. Yeah. Not, I mean, it was like. Yeah, if you told me they changed everybody, I would have believed it because it's just, you know, <laughs> yeah, a whole different yeah. art to it. I mean, you know, the thing I, I notice when I see somebody on TV now is like, I can't understand a word, first of all. And um, it, it, because they don't leave, I mean, they don't leave any room for the lyric and, and, and the melody, um, which seems but to be on purpose. There's not and, much melody in the new songs. They're just yeah, two, two right. tone melodies, isn't it? Yeah. And the arrangements are, are always ridiculously long. I mean, you know, if you if you would normally have a four bar or an eight bar intro, it'll go on for sixteen bars or more. I mean, it's just like every song is like five and a half minutes long. It's like, well, you know, what happened? It used to be, uh, uh, you know, a two minute song. Uh, uh, got it across. Yeah. Um, so. I mean, uh, uh, there probably is stuff out there. I just, you know, um, yeah. all of the ma mainstream stuff. I'm with you on that. It's like the same chord progression the whole time. You're like, dude, come on. The nothing's, yeah. nothing's ever. I think the production is better than the songs. Like a lot of the production is cool, but then the music is like, yeah. yeah. And and the other thing that strikes me, I mean, having grown up with it, is that when when the, the music I was listening to, you know, when, when I was growing up. I, I like to say it was so mysterious. I mean, it was, you know, I mean, all these, all these records, everybody's records. I mean, it, you know, they sounded like they were coming from another planet. Yeah. I, you know, they, they you had no idea how, I mean, speaking as somebody who was, um, 
you know, who wanted to know how this stuff worked. I mean, uh, uh, had some vague knowledge. Yeah. Um, it, you know, it was just so uh, otherworldly. And now, of course, you know, everything's on the internet, everything's on YouTube. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, anybody for a very, very small amount of money um, um, can get within range of the best recording studio in the world. I mean, the difference between amateur recording and professional, there is no difference anymore. It's what you do with it. Yeah. Um, I mean, um, it, it, and there's, you know, I mean, good and bad things. I mean, it's the exact same technology that I'm using, you know, uh, to mix in a more creative way and do better things, you know, with, for, for what I work with. It's the same, it's the same thing. Um, and I, I mean, you could argue about this with any, you know, any aspect of technology for, well, recording or anything else. Hmm. Uh, you know, there was a time when uh, overdubbing a vocal was, uh, a, a, you know, if you got caught, if, if the AFM caught you overdubbing a vocal, you were supposed to pay all the musicians again because for that, right. in order to, to do a vocal, I mean, to do, you know, you, you uh, uh, when it was just mono, Okay. Um, you know, unless you were going to dump machine to machine, you had to do it all live. I mean, I, 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 guys I used to work for told me stories of, you know, doing Dean Martin records and they'd go in the studio with a 20 piece orchestra and Dean, and they would, you know, they would record like it was live and they'd say, thank you very much. We got it. Uh, the engineer, the producer and Dean would go around the corner, have dinner, come back and lock the doors wow. and then do, do overdub the vocals so they wouldn't get caught. Man, that's crazy. Yeah, yeah. Oh, overdubbing is... was, you know, well, I mean, you know, it goes back further than that. I mean, uh, uh, when radio started playing records, I mean, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and you can keep going and say, you know, the industry embraced CDs like nobody's business because it made them a ton of money, but that technology. But then when... um Spot, I'm not Spotify, but when uh, what do you call it? Napster came along, uh, you know, they thought they could they could sue it out of existence. Yeah, I mean, it was just, you know, <laughs> incredibly dumb. Yeah. Um, and uh, uh, you know, so now, <laughs> you know, now the wrong uh, the money making is largely in the hands of third parties, you know, and the record labels, and the artists are getting screwed. Yeah, and uh, that you know, I have trouble understanding why anybody would even want. Uh, I mean, I guess if you could, well, when you could tour, it wasn't so bad. And I guess they're trying to get back to it. Um, yeah, why you you know why you'd want to go there? You know, the best and brightest. Um, you know what? What's what's the attraction? I, I don't. Um, I have trouble seeing it. The same as you know as it was forty years ago. But then you know if you're just new to it. Yeah, and I do wonder. I mean, if I'd had this kind of technology, um, you know, back then, you know, what I could have accomplished. Just you know, and there were bands and you know things to do, but didn't have the didn't have the equipment. And um, I mean, I, you know, I used to do remote recording, uh, you know, on my own with a portable sixteen track and all this stuff that we would drag around. You know, some of it were, were actual records, but a lot of it was just sort of for funsies. That's cool. Um, was that the Nigeras? Was that it? Was there Nigeras? Nigeras? They were like portable reel to reels. Well, I'm sorry? I, did you use one of those Nigeras or Nigeras? Oh, like no, was, no, no. We were using, I, I had a Stevens uh, uh, 16 track that uh -huh. um, was very, very small. Um, and, uh, but, you know, it's hanging around, hauling around mic breeze and, you know, analog cable and. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, you know, I own a big remote truck now, which is actually doing a, a shoot for Metallica today. And uh, wow, sweet man! It'll be on Kimmel, I think. I don't know if it's tonight or next week, but um, um, you know, we and we can handle 192 tracks. Why we should need 192 yeah. tracks is another, you know, another yeah. question. <laughs> um, and you know, practically every band. Uh, you know, we ever see is, has got the playback, um, you know, to some degree, and 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 from a from a 
work point of view, that that's actually good because it, it eliminates a lot of you know problems with live performance. On the other hand, it also takes away the spontaneity of the performance because whatever you're doing, you have to follow this, you know, this click track from here to here. You can't go, well, let's break it down and you know, <laughs> or do an extra chord. Nope, nope, you're just going. Yeah. And um, well, that's okay. Um, I, I think you know an awful lot of music has been affected by, you know, by that. Mm. Uh, that you know that you you are hemmed in like that. Um, it's just one more thing um, that that that's changed. You know the uh, the way the music is. Um, I mean, I'm always impressed when I you know when I get something that was actually recorded the old way. <laughs> Human beings <laughs> and not beat detected. You know, whether they speed up or slow down, you know. Yeah, I like that. I like yeah, no, I, I, I like those flaws and records. Even in like um in um still believe in you. I believe in you. I still oh yeah, you. well there's a good like, example. Eh, 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 eh. <laughs> that's cool. Yeah, I mean that's there because Ryan conceptualized the song uh, and called it my childhood. It's not clear whether um uh Roger uh, uh um uh, ever wrote li- ever wrote lyrics for it but you know they had the track so when it became a love song the bicycle bell and the, and the little bicycle horn were there <laughs> and you know unless he was going to recut the entire track they were going to stay nowadays they would have been done as probably as an overdub and you could take them out in a minute would that be better no. yeah um and there are all kinds of mistakes in records i uh, uh beach boy records too i mean uh, uh they they get left in because uh, because you couldn't you, you couldn't get rid of them, um, but it didn't it didn't it didn't hurt anything certainly, and maybe it helped. I don't know. I mean, uh, on um, on Big Surrey on Holland, Holland that that kind of the that version, three yeah. the three the three piece, it kind of goes to the left and then goes to the right. Is is that was that done purposely? There's some well, like thing. Mean? The sound of it kind of goes from the left ear over to the right ear on one. Oh, I don't, well, I'm sure. Well, if it's there, I'm sure it was done on purpose. I, I, I don't. I don't uh, it's some part on the tr- on the trilogy of the part. I don't know, but I remember hearing it first. I was like, "Oh, was that deliberately done? It was kind of going left and right." Yeah, it would. It would have been. You know, is it on? Is it when? Is it the start of uh, "On My Way to California"? The, maybe. Yeah. Maybe. The marches. Yeah. Yeah, it's on one part, and I was. Uh, I was. I was like, huh. Oh, okay. So, but it was kind of cool, you know. Like those things are kind of cool because they're so different. Whereas now everything's like so beat detective, and I hate that crap because it just every drummer sounds like a drum machine now. And yeah, right. Well, yeah. I mean, uh, you know, I always say it's not the technology in and of itself isn't good or evil. It's just you know, it's just what you do with it. That's um, true. Um, or it can be used for good or evil, if you will. Yeah. Um, and I've been down that road. I mean. Uh, you know, auto tune. Well, it's large. It it, it 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 can be very useful. Um, uh, you know, just fix one little thing. Unfortunately, it often you know, well, forgetting the 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 silly sounds. But I mean, just to fix an out of tune vocal. Yeah. Um, but you can go down a rabbit hole. I was working on a project, one of these iHeart things last year, whenever it was. It wouldn't have been no two years ago now. And I uh, was a country artist, a very, you know, well-respected, good singing. But as it tends to be with country artists, they, their producer and whatever engineer, you know, got deep into the tuning and, and you know, we wound up like going through, you know, line by line and, you know, you know looking at it as much as anything. And, oh, yeah. uh, and, and some of it's just kind of silly because one thing that kept happening more than once was, you, you know, I have to you pick a section. Okay, we got a two got two minute line. Okay, so I have to load that into uh, the tuning program, and yeah. then I can, you know, I can alter it. And more than once, I would, you know, I play it. So I'm playing that line into the tuning program. I haven't done anything, <laughs> and the producer goes, "Oh, that's much better." Oh man! No, it's not. It's exactly the same. <laughs> but I've done it to my I, the same project did it to myself. I did it. I drew the line. I played it. And, oh, that's better. And then I looked, and the tuning plugin was in bypass. <laughs> I was hearing exactly what it started with, but you know, 
<laughs> you know, the, the hearing is a funny thing. I can remember in the old days with the analog console, you know, working on something going, eh, I need a little more high end on the, on the symbols or something. And look, ah, it's much better. And then 10 minutes later, look and realize that the EQ isn't in. <laughs> I, 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 I increased the high end. So I heard quote unquote more high end, but <laughs> yeah Matt, it's crazy isn't it what the hearing does like or your mind does i should say you know we're we're convinced of certain things and we're like especially those well, kind yeah, you know, those... Yeah, well, you know it, it's related to the fact that we can listen to music you know in all in, in all levels of high fidelity if you will i mean you know maybe some of the oldest oldest 78s can be a little hard to listen to because they're so limited in bandwidth but but you know, I mean, I I collected seventy eights for years, and the music's great, and the the you know the, the noise or the you know the limited fidelity didn't didn't, didn't hurt a bit. Um, yeah. They have actually contributed to the experience. Um, yeah. uh, you know, it, it, it's um, it's it's all subjective rather than objective. And, yeah. Um, um, I mean that's you know that's what art and music and music is, <clears throat> and I mean I you know I'm I'm happy when you ask about the Beach Boys you know to have this stuff to work on because it's still you know the kind of music that I appreciate. I mean, if there's anything I listen to, um, it's probably <laughs> it's probably at least thirty years old. <laughs> uh, hey, that's uh, the that's the good stuff, man. That's the good stuff. I've been listening to these um, uh, the tone poets. You know, Blue Note have been doing these uh, re-releases of the old old Blue Note records. They sound yeah. phenomenal. They just sound incredible. They're remastered by Kevin Gray, and they just sound man, just like it sounds like they're in the room. Oh, well, that's so, probably yeah, more than more the recording than anything else. But yeah, I mean, especially when you're back back in the days of capturing a performance. I, I actually just got. Um, I bought some tapes from a guy who had worked at a big studio out here and uh, in, in the sixties. And he was in, he was the one who would go to the library and, you know, pull stuff that, you know, was junk. They weren't going to use it and, you know, and toss it. And he was told he could keep it. So the one thing I got was the James Brown session and, cool. um, and it's, you know, mono live everything. And you just listen to it and you go, we have not progressed. You know, I mean, clearly it starts with, you know, how good the band was. Yeah. But, I mean, just in terms of uh, of the recording, I mean, it's just amazing. Um, wow. And, um, <laughs> uh, you know, this is like 1961 or something. Um, wow. That, how's that like getting those reels and just putting them on? That must be incredible. Just just because it's just it as it is almost. No, yeah, it's all the outtakes. I mean, the master is off the is gone off the reel, but it's all the outtakes. So there's like right, a, right, a few false starts and uh, and one other complete take. Uh, but it's just like every time they they hit it, it's like you know, <laughs> it's like right there, just like the record. And you, you know, that's my, cool. you know, live to mono. And, uh, <laughs> I don't know, you know, no way of knowing how you know how many mics or you know what the, what they were doing at this point in time. Um, but it's just, you know, as an engineer and producer, you just listen, I listen to it and I go, man, <laughs> you know, uh, we, we aren't doing anything that good now. Yeah. Um, um, you know, stereo, 5.1, immersive, all this stuff, you know, it's all kind of, <laughs> kind of beside the point. <laughs> yeah, man. Before I let you go, because I've taken up so much time, I'm like, thanks so much. Um, a, you're going releasing hopefully Carnal of Passions in Holland at some stage and working your way up from there why well, do we really haven't talked much past, past that but yeah <laughs> uh, I, I think it, uh, I can't say 100% because we haven't you know we haven't specifically agreed on everything but I mean this, you know, this has been very successful so I've been assured that um, that you know that's what we will uh, yeah we will do next year um awesome um it would well we, well we have a lot of stuff that you know part of this has always been um uh, a copyright um or oh, the issues. 50 years thing the england thing is it yeah, yeah the, the 50, 50 years thing in england 
And uh, so that, you know, that, that the good news is that made projects like the 64, 67, and 68 projects viable, although only one of those got released um, physically, which was unfortunate. But, yeah. Um, Wild Hunt and this, incredible. And, and uh, you know, and going onward. So um, the necessity of it um, helps in terms of, of uh, determining uh, that, that, you know, that, that we'll do these because yeah. there, there's a long, um, um, a, a long t- term need to have this stuff, uh, have the ownership. Yeah. Continue. <laughs> uh, well, and I mean, and so, you know, the powers that be, uh, see that as valuable and worth, um, worth spending money on where if it was yeah. just, uh, you know, put out this 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 stuff. You know, how much money is it going to make? Uh, yeah. I mean, I you know, I know the box has been incredibly successful, um, and apparently has sold ten thousand copies. Now that's cool. You know, that's that's a big big success for a physical package. Yeah. Um, not a lot of numbers. Um, I mean, you know, but it does all the stuff, you know, streaming and uh, the the good vibrations box in '93. I think did something like one hundred and twenty five thousand. Um, they were those were the that, days that was all that was was physical. I mean, there's nothing but uh, whatever that was five five CDs. I think. I mean, that's the only way you could buy it. <laughs> yeah. Wow. So it's hard to it it it's there's no real equivalency uh, with today. They yeah. tell me it's they tell me it's doing great and uh, it's you know better than anybody expected. That's, that's awesome. all I need to know. That's awesome, man. It sounds great. I love it. I love it. Like I was saying, I just love all the kind of extra bits that you'd ever don't hear. And it's cool, man. Well, I, I mean, I'm, I'm always really fond of, of peeling the onion. I mean, you know, my favorite stuff tends to be, you know, take, take a record that, you know, like this whole world. And now let's take the lead vocal out. And yeah, so you get, you get it. Suddenly you get a much better sense of, the, you know the creative process. I mean, uh, when it doesn't sound exactly like the record anymore, or do acapella, and 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 see that. I mean, that to me, um, that's that's one of the things that I really get off on. Uh, uh, and because of the way my brain works, I actually wind up now knowing all those background parts. <laughs> Brilliant. Um, and you know, where the Beach Boys are concerned, it's just like holy shit. You know. Yeah. Um, um, you know the, the the creativity going in going into all those vocals uh it's just just mind-boggling all, yeah. all, always has been you know uh, they're beautiful like even this i love hearing uh all i want to do i love that song of sunflower i just think that is oh, such yeah. a great song and the acapella that was put on that fucking brilliant man i was like ah oh. you can yeah, just I mean, listen we to, try to we try to find the things i mean you know that that that, that we like and that we think everybody everybody else will like there's always a couple of things, you know, that we missed. I would have liked to have put a acapella breakaway on there. Oh and, man, uh, that would be cool. <laughs> actually, we even proposed putting that out as a, you know, as a, you know, pre-release bonus track only, and that that just, you know, just ran into, you know, the way the record companies work these days. Yeah, and you can't you can't do ghost tracks anymore, and oh god, uh, because streaming is now ubiquitous. Uh, <laughs> You know that they, they don't want exclusive tracks for the you know for a while you, you did all these extra tracks for the uh download media mm-hmm. to drive sales and for whatever reason you know that's been it's been determined that 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 every all that all the products um i mean that you know the five cd and the online and the streaming all have to be exactly the same now i don't know how that fits when the vinyl isn't the same, or the two CD isn't the same. But... <laughs> though, though I will say, back in the day, I hated when I'd get a CD of an album and it'd have two bonus tracks at the end of the album because I was like, "Oh no, it's take it." I liked the album as like a story, and then there was oh. the two extra tracks. I was like, "Ah oh, no, man!" It really annoyed me. I don't know why, but it just annoyed me. Well, it's funny. We've got people that are annoyed that we 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 put a couple of bonus tracks on the uh, on the LPs um, on one side. End. Yeah, uh, yeah, and it's like, well, first of all, if we hadn't done that, there'd be no bonus tracks on the two LP versions. <laughs> yeah. um, but I was kind of, you know, and people even saying, "I'd rather they weren't there at all than they were." <laughs> <laughs> You'll never please everyone. 
Well, no, no, that's yeah. You <laughs> learn that you learn that early on, and that's why I don't I, I do not participate in the in the message boards because it's you know why is um, I mean I'll do it in interviews. You know, ask question about why we did this or why we did that, and I'll be happy to, you know interview it. Let's say it for publication, but to do it on in those forums. Um, it just never really works. Yeah, it's, a, it's a losing battle. A losing you go down battle. a rabbit hole of, of uh, you know, 17 <laughs> other questions that have nothing to do with what you were, you know. I mean, there's one, there was one yesterday that I, I, I was tempted. I'm hoping somebody will answer. I don't know if you noticed the, um, the re-record of Surf's Up Part 1. Yeah. Um, we've talked about this, and it says it in there. But what that is, is it, it, you know, when they were attempting to finish Surf's Up, they didn't have... Uh, they didn't have a vocal on part one, the, the wrecking crew part. And Brian refused to sing it. So the first thing they tried was they tried to fly Brian's vocal into that We're using tape machine. It didn't work. We have the tape. Then they thought, well, okay, we'll use Brian's vocal and we'll bring the musicians back and have them play to Brian's vocal. And that's what that is. That's the wrecking crew oh, wow. trying to follow Brian's vocal and lay down track. And it's it's okay. It's not yeah. as good as the original, but it's pretty good. No. And then they abandoned that and just decided to have Carl sing. And then they cobbled the second half, um, you know, using using Brian's uh, uh, piano vocal version. Mm. Um, I mean, you know, it, it works great, but the, the decision making that must have gone into how you know uh, how to assemble that obviously went through a bunch of changes. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Before they figured out a way that would. That would work. Now I, you know, I there's a version on there. I put Brian's vocal in the first part, and it took no time at all. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, even the one line that, that, that was missing, I put in. Um, you know, again, just you know, because because digital, you know, DAW makes it so easy. Yeah, that is cool, man. That is cool. Well, thank you so much for this. It's been so... I probably could talk to you for hours, but I know you're busy. <laughs> and I have a million and one questions, but thank you so much. I really appreciate right. it, man. So cool. Right, good so good talking to you. Keep up the badass work. I'll be, I'll be <laughs> buying it, man. Have a great day. All right, you too. Bye-bye. Thank you, Mark, so much. Bye-bye.